dear ladies, dear gentlemen, I would like to uh, welcome you uh, today at the Education uh, Edu Cafe. Uh, my name is uh, Vendula Novačkova. I am the head of office of the representation of the South Moravian region. And uh, uh, today uh, we met because of the uh, second Edu Cafe this year. Uh, today's topic is the education, combating disinformation through education, which is hosted by representation of South Moravian region and the office of Cello uh, in Brussels. I would like to warmly thank to our honored guest and our moderator. Uh, and just let you know that uh, this event is uh, also filmed. And uh, now I would, lo I would like to uh, pass my uh, uh, floor to Lenka Procházková, uh, the head of uh, Cello Office. So, uh, thank Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, okay, uh, dear guests, ladies, gentlemen, also uh, I would like to welcome you uh, from my side and on behalf of uh, Czech uh, Cello Office, uh, which is part of Czech National Agency for International Education and Research. And today we are really happy that also our director, Michal Uhl, he... <laughs> he came from Prague uh, to watch uh, the Educafé himself uh, as well. So uh, this year we are celebrating the European Year of Youth. Uh, we are listening to young people, uh, supporting them and highlighting their importance in building a future world. Throughout the whole year, the European Union uh, wants to show its support for young people and its appreciation of everything they went through during the pandemic, but also give them the opportunity to be part of future development of Europe. It is also important to offer flexible opportunities to young people to further their competencies and skills, especially in today's changing world. And the ability to recognize this information is one of these competencies. Daily we are overwhelmed with a lot of information from different sources and it is essential that not only young people, but everyone uh, is able to navigate among them and to recognize if any information is false or misleading. Education system is crucial in this process, which is why we decided to dedicate this EduCafe to the topic of tackling disinformation and mediate uh, literacy in education. During tonight's debate, we want to focus on the role of universities in tackling disinformation, on the training and professional development of teachers and future fe teachers, and also on how to transform this into specific activities for students and youth. So without any further ado, <laughs> let me introduce the moderator of our debate, Aneta Zachova. She is an EU policy expert and the editor-in-chief of the Erective CZ server. She is also a PhD candidate in international relations and European politics at the Masaryk University in Brno, focusing on European Union in times of crisis. So Aneta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great uh, honor for me to moderate this debate and I'm very happy that I can see that many people here in Brussels are interested in uh, knowledge and expertise of uh, Czech experts on this information. Uh, I don't think that much more introduction is needed. Uh, I would like to introduce you, not the topic, uh, but the speakers, because of course every successful discussion is about uh, expertise and about the speakers who will present us uh, their ideas and uh, who will share their knowledge with us. So I would like to introduce you uh, Lucie Čejkova, who is a journalist, uh, lecturer and also researcher at the Department of Media Studies and Journalism at the Faculty of Social Studies at uh, Masaryk University. Uh, she uh, focuses on uh, improving media literacy of the er elderly and uh, she is also a member of the Executive Council of Fakescape. Uh, Fakescape is a student association from Masaryk University which is aiming to develop media literacy of pupils and students. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Kamil Kopecký. Uh, Kamil Kopecký is an associate professor 
at the Department of Czech Language at the Faculty of Education at Palacki University in Olomouc. And he's also the head of the Center for the Prevention and Risky Virtual Communication. And last but not least, I would like to introduce you Mr. Josef Schlerka. Uh, Mr. Schlerka is the head of New Media Studies at the Faculty of Arts at Charles University in Prague. And uh, he is a well-known university lecturer and expert on social media. And he also do network data analysis and he also is focusing on semiotics. So uh, these are our speakers. Uh, when it comes to program of our today's discussion, we will start with uh, 20 minutes uh, presentation. Uh, then uh, I will proceed with uh, my follow-up questions and with the debate uh, with panelists. And then, of course, I would like to pass the floor to you. So if you have any questions, uh, you will have time uh, after the presentation to ask uh, our panelists uh, on the details or whatever you are interested in when it comes to disinformation and uh, media literacy. Uh, after the Q&A session, we will end our discussion with an exercise because uh, Lucie uh, prepared for you a real exercise uh, on this information. So you will have the possibility to, to try her Fakescape project, uh, which I mentioned in the, in the beginning. So that's the program for today. And I think it's time to start with the presentation. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Mr. Josef Schlerka to, to take the floor and present us the phenomena of uh, disinformation. Okay, Please, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, I would like to start with a, a wider context of this discussion, especially the topics about the disinformation. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would like to start with uh, four claims. The claims are from our research. Uh, two years ago, we published this research together with the Nielsen Atmosphere Agency, and uh, there is a four claim. The first one is that the coronavirus was artificially created in laboratories thanks to funding from Bill Gates. The 16% in Czech Republic agree with these claims. 16%. What is interesting, a 40 only 40% in our country thinks that this is the clear disinformation and intentional disinformation. The second claim, the uh, 5G signal transmitters can have significantly negative impact on the human health. Again, 16% in our country agree with this. The next is, uh, this is really interesting, the illegal, immigra illegal migration of Muslims to Europe is organized by the EU. Close 30% in our country believe that this is true. And the last one, demonstrations against the governments in the Czech, Slovakia, and Hungary is financed by George Soros. Again, 11%, well, 12% agree with this claim. My question is, is there some disinformation, conspiracy, populist framing? What is the gender of these claims? Because we know that the coronavirus, there is a some probability that was created artificially, but in intentionally by the Bill Gates money. And in the end, these four claims are mixed, uh, mixed together, uh, three different perspectives. Next. The one of this disinforma disinformation. This overuse terms in our public discussion, unfortunately, because the disinformation is in the end the, the army terms from the war. And it's information used as a weapon if I try to uh, push your mind in my way. That's mean, that means this innovation can be defined as a type of information designed to persuade its in recipient or victim in reaching a decision. You can read this, this, <laughs> this, uh, this definition. Next, the conspiracy theory. It's a completely different part of the game because it's a type of the story. It's a story about the rulers of the world who are behind the world, the good and evil. Nothing in the world has happened Accidentally, everything is organized. This is a type of narratives. It's not type of information. The last, the populist framing, is a way how to use the, some kinds of conspiracy thinking, like the, the evil allies and the good ordinary people. And it's a way how to frame public discussion and how to divide the society. And all four claims 
sometimes but, but sometimes are the part of populist framing like the Soros discussion and discussion about the Ill illegal migration to the Europe. Sometimes the part of the conspiracy theory, sometimes the pure disinformation. Next, the problem is that these three forms of information threats mixed together, rising as a back end of the Trump and other populist politics in the world because they are using these types of information threats as a driver for their success in the politics. And the results are really bad. After attack of the capital, the research was that QAnon, in QAnon theories in US believes, 15% people. <laughs> Next. We have the second case in Czech Republic, the Yarmir Balda, which was radicalized by the extreme right party. Uh, SPD in Czech Republic. Next. No what? What do you It's an eternal question by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. We, fortunately, we know <laughs> what, what we can do. There is a work my friend and colleague, Jakub Kalensky, uh, who defined the four lines of defense. Next. The first of lines is documenting the threat. We need to document it. We need to make a database with the conspiracy theories, with the disinformation. It's something what EU Disinfo Unit is doing just now in the, in the Brussels, for example. Next, the second one, raising awareness about the threat. We need to discuss about it. We need to make films, write articles, discuss about it. We need to discuss that this is a real problem, because it is. Third. Repairing, mitigating, and preventing weakness. This is the part which is so important in our education system because we are not able to defeat in this game only on one platform, but in the education system, we are able to do a lot of work. The last one from the four, this is the job for the intelligence services <laughs> because the mostly this is behind the crimes and for example, connected with the cryptocurrency crimes, sometimes it's paid by from the Russians. Yeah, it's work for our intelligence services. And next, I think that we can use education as a weapon in this game, but in the two specific ways. And it's unfortunately not the right answer for all our problems. The first one is a promoting critical of science, science thinking because what we know is that the people who believe to in conspiracy theories are mostly correlated with a strong pseudoscience beliefs like the 5G networks and influence to the health. Usually we're speaking about the flat earth, <laughs> but there's much more anti-science beliefs. And we know that they are usually connected with a religiosity as an extreme form of anti-science beliefs. And I think that the promoting of the critical thinking and the critical science thinking, we are able to improve the, their cognitive capacity. And the uh, second, that the media literacy it will be the main topic of my colleagues. And there is a, a famous quote of the, Shen, uh, of the Steve Bannon from the six or seven years ago, there was the real opposition is the media, and the way to deal with them is the flu the zone with shit. And in this code, it's key to success strategy of alt-right in, in the US. Uh, some partially winner of the Russians' propaganda in some European countries, because if we flu the zone with shit, and nobody's able to recognize what is the shit, then we lost the war. Thank you, it's the last point. Thank you very much. I think that applause is more than needed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can proceed with our uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to now ask uh, Mr. Kamel Kopetsky to, to take the floor. Thank you for the word. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say something about uh, what we know about Czech teachers and media ed uh, education. I'm from Faculty of Education at Palacki University, so I will, s I will speak about Czech teachers. And maybe I will ask uh, how many of people are from the Czech Republic? Can you raise your hand? Uh, 
Oh, great. The most of people. So, so the topic is right for you, <laughs> and maybe for other other guests. So, first of all, I have four questions, and I will answer this these questions. Uh, first will be: Do teachers support media education in schools? So, it will be very crucial for us. Uh, the second will be: Which media education topics are important for for teachers? So, it will be a very huge uh, part of uh, my presentation. Uh, another part will be uh, what media do they consider credible, so if they believe in conspiracy newspapers, conspiracy websites, so I will try to say something about this, this part. And also, can teachers spot disinformation? So I, I will continue uh, with, with the story from Josef Schlerka, and I will try to transfer it to the, to the uh, teacher, to the teacher uh, group. So ne next, please. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say something about the research. The research is uh, Czech Teachers in the World of Media. It's uh, from 2021. And if you have mobile phones, you can download it with the using of QR code you see on the screen. Uh, the, the research was focusing on the teachers from primary and secondary schools. And uh, in, in uh, samples, there were about uh, 2,000 teachers from primary, uh, primary, secondary, and other levels of education. Average age was 47. It's normal. I don't know how is it in your country, but in the Czech Republic, the average age of teachers is uh, between uh, 47, 40, 48 years. And the gender, 77% were females. It's also normal. Uh, do, do <laughs> yeah. in, in the Czech uh, educational system, uh, the most of uh, teachers are, are females. Next, please. So, first question. Uh, do teachers support media education in schools? Uh, if we ask the teachers for this question, 91% uh, of teachers agree that media education is important. So it's, it's nice, great. But if we ask uh, if uh, they would like to raise a time or raise a, a account of subjects which are focused on media literacy or media education, they are told uh, uh, that th they don't think that uh, uh, the amount of time uh, could be uh, raised. So 38% of teachers, they don't want to, to increase the time for these lessons, and 31% uh, uh, told us that they didn't know. So if you look, look on, the uh, on the graph on the right side, you see uh, realization of media education at uh, Czech schools. If you look on the graphic, so you see that about 3% of schools, they have a special subject, media uh, literacy or media education. So special sub subjects, as you know, uh, uh, Czech language, mathematics, and also media education. Uh, another, another part of uh, the respondents told us that they realized media education across various subjects. So the topic is implemented, for example, in the Czech language, in mathematics, in civics, in many other subjects at primary school. If you ask uh, uh, for, for realization, so you see 45% uh, of teachers, they don't uh, teach about media literacy. They don't use media literacy in lessons, and the, the, the other part, no, no answer. Next, please. <laughs> so the most relevant topics of media education at Czech uh, primary and secondary schools. So if you look on the topics, you see that some topics are not maybe about media literacy, but also about some kind of information literacy or digital literacy, uh, because if you look on the top uh, of, of the list, we see using the internet search for information. Uh, I see the, the num number 59% uh, of uh, teachers told us that they taught uh, the, the, uh, the, the topic uh, uh, at the school. So on a uh, second place, computer safety and security, especially passwords, uh, safety of, of uh, some, uh, some accounts, uh, for example, on social networks. Uh, activities focus on supporting media literacy. They need uh, worksheets, they need materials, they need examples how to teach and how to use media, media literacy topic uh, in lessons, for example, in lessons of uh, languages. Another, uh, using the internet uh, social networks, you see 35%. And now if you look on the topic disinformation, hoaxes and fake news, about 30% of teachers told us that they uh, are working with this topic at primary or secondary school. Just 30%. Yeah? Other, other recognizing relevant sources of information, uh, finding the way uh, through the world of media, and also working with media products. Advertisement, especially uh, one special topic was uh, influencing marketing. Maybe you know influencing marketing. It's a new topic of, uh, of problem, which is connected with advertisement uh, uh, online. Yeah, next slide, please. 
So now about uh, credibility and the media. So the question was, uh, what media do teachers consider credible? If you look on the top places, we see uh, Czech Press Agency, Iroslas, it's, uh, it's uh, radio, uh, Czech radio, uh, Iroslas is just a server about uh, Czech radio, and uh, Czech television 24, 71%. So you see that, that, that the most uh, credible media are uh, media public service. Yeah, uh, no, uh, it's not about commercial media, but, uh, but uh, just about uh, media public service. Next. And now the part about disinformation and the question was, uh, can teachers uh, spot uh, disinformation? Uh, we prepared a database of claims. There were claims uh, from three groups of uh, information. Uh, uh, there was a content uh, focused on disinformation and conspiracy, but also normal, normal claim, uh, for example, about European Union and other, other, uh, uh, other topics. So if you look on the groups, first group was about information and the disinformation about European Union. Uh, group two was about uh, information and disinformation re related to uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the last one was about disinformation from the world. And they can, they, they can answer true, false. I'm not sure it's very important to ask if, is, if the person is sure that, you, uh, that he know uh, if uh, it's a fake or it's uh, true information. And also, uh, I am not able to critically assess the information. It's very important to ask because we don't have uh, enough information, for example, about uh, COVID pandemic. Maybe I don't know if it was from laboratory or not. We, I don't have this information. So uh, I think it's, it's good to ask for this question. Uh, and, uh, and the teacher can say, I don't know because I don't have uh, enough information from this kind of topic. Yeah? Next, please. So, and you see some examples of claims. Uh, there were really, really a lot of claims about chemtrails and COVID-19 nanochips, NVO conspiracy, uh, EU want to ban something. Uh, for example, Z, uh, you know that we have a special Z. Uh, so, so one claim was about EU wants to, it was demonstration. <laughs> because I see the most, the most people are from the Czech Republic, so they understand. Uh, there are also questions about MMR vaccine and autism, about, uh, I don't know, uh, European Union has uh, prohibited us from uh, producing gram. It's very popular in the Czech Republic, this topic, gram. <laughs> Consumption of gram, I don't know, maybe you know. I like gram, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, uh, for example, uh, COVID-19 is spreaded by uh, 5G networks, so, so there are many claims. So look, well, let's look on the results. Conclusion. Uh, this conclusion is from all groups, uh, groups together. Yeah? So 61% uh, of Czech, Czech teachers are able to correctly assess the trueness of uh, statements. So 61. I think it's a it's good number. 61% is great. Uh, another 15% of Czech teachers admit uh, that uh, they are not able to assess the state statement. I think it's also a positive finding because, because they told that they don't have enough information right now uh, to recognize if it's true or false. I think it's, it's great. And now if you look on the red line, about 10% of Czech teachers assess the trueness of the statement incorrectly. So they believe in, uh, in false content, on, in disinformation, hoaxes, fake news, conspiracy, and the problem is uh, that uh, they, they are sharing this. Uh, they are sharing this uh, among other, other people. So, uh, but I, I think that it's not great, but I think it's normal. Because the population of Czech teachers is about 180,000 people. So I think that it, it, uh, in this huge population, 10%, it's not too, too bad. Yeah? It's, I think it's quite, uh, quite uh, normal. Kashi, <laughs> next. So uh, the last slide uh, is about what we do for teachers and children at the uh, Faculty of Education. This is promotion slide. <laughs> yeah, first, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, understand, you understand influencer marketing, so it, it's a product placement, I think, maybe. So first of all, at our faculty, we are making workshops and lessons for teachers about internet safety, about media literacy, and also about positive using of technologies in education. So these topics are very important for us. And uh, we are making also lessons for children, but I think that uh, uh, the most relevant speaker in the realm of children uh, will be uh, another person. So thank you for attention and have a nice Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamel, for all the data. I know they were related to the Czech Republic, but I think that uh, the situation in other countries could be similar. 
Uh, I would like to now ask uh, Lucie for presenting us the project Fakescape. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'll remain seated if, if you don't mind, and I'll have only promotion slides. <laughs> um, I'll introduce you shortly to Fakescape, uh, which uh, I think uh, in this debate and in, in this evening is um, an example of a way to help teachers with media literacy and media education. And recently, we also started uh, educating children also in the field of cybersecurity. So next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Fakescape started in 2018, and uh, these are basically the starting points that led us to establishing Fakescape. Uh, we felt that this information is becoming a threat to Czech society and to democracy in the Czech Republic. And we also uh, noticed that Czechs encounter fake news, uh, mostly on the internet, but also from other sources. And at the same time, they lack media literacy skills. Um, we had this information also from research, for example, uh, in 2018, research by Czech um, research agency Stemmark, only uh, about 25% of Czech adult population um, was able to uh, satisfactory tell the difference between false information and uh, prove that they have the necessary media literacy skills. And uh, there were also other contextual points, such as the fact that more and more people consume news and information from the internet, and also, uh, for example, the fact that many major media outlets in the Czech Republic are owned by rich people or oligarchs. So these were basically the starting points for us. Uh, so we established Fakescape, which became a um, fast-growing organization. And we are mostly aimed at improving media literacy and media literacy education and cybersecurity skills. Uh, while doing so, we utilize uh, innovative teaching techniques and methods, such as gamification. I would say that gamification is our primary method because the way that our workshops uh, usually look is that we go to schools when they invite us. Uh, we give uh, the students short introduction, then we give them worksheets and they uh, go through sort of game where they try their skills of information verification or um, false image verification and so on. And at the end of this workshop and this game, uh, we discuss these topics with them and we give them short lecture about these topics. So next slide, please. Uh, we have much, uh, many activities for different target groups. We have some activities for the general public. Uh, we are now working on an activity for all the people. Uh, but uh, to give you some overview of activities that we have for teachers and for schools and um, in general in education, I prepared this slide just to show that we have activities for younger students. Uh, we have in together two workshops now. The first is called Desinfombies, and it's mostly about information verification, uh, false images. Then we have Kiberno, which is a cybersecurity workshop, and an online course called Fakescaper, which is also uh, applicable for older students. Uh, for older students, we have a workshop called Save the Holidays, which is the one that you will be able to try in a shortened version at the end of today's, uh, today's session here. And we also try to provide support for teachers um, we give them bonus tasks for Save the Holidays workshop so they can follow up after our workshop uh, with methodology. We give them a um, card game, which we developed and we also distributed for the general public. But in schools, we have it with a methodology, again, how to apply this in, uh, in lessons of media literacy or some similar subjects such as Czech language and so on. It's called Don't Feed the Canard. Uh, I tried to uh, translate it into English. And we also provide a course for teachers yeah. called Gamification in Media Literacy Education. So next slide, please. And with these workshops, we visited more than 350 places. Uh, as you can see, we were slowed down a bit by the pandemic. We were able to adapt somehow by uh, making our workshops online. But I think the, what works the most is the personal contact and actually going to schools and giving the lectures there. And we also visited over 15 countries now uh, because we have our workshops in English and I think also in Polish and Slovak language. So that's just a short introduction to Fakescape. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lucie, for presenting us a very interesting uh, project. Uh, let's now uh, move uh, and let's start with the discussion before I will uh, pass the floor to our audience for questions. I prepared also some questions, so I would like to use the opportunity and ask our speakers. Um, when I was preparing for this event, I found uh, Eurobarometer survey. And I found out that according to this survey, 76% of Czech people and also 62% of Europeans believe that it is easy for them to spot fake news. Mm, for me, or I think that uh, many people are really self-confident. <laughs> so I would like to ask our speakers um, whether they think that uh, these claims really reflect the reality. And I would like to start with Josef, if you could know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lucia, uh, you, you are you are um, attending lectures. You are speaking with students. You are speaking also with uh, older people. Mm, do you think that this self conf confidence of Czech society really reflects the reality? Well, I think, as you mentioned, it is difficult to tell the reality. I can only give some examples from practice. And for example, when, I, when we go to schools and give lectures there, it often happens that students tell us um, that they think that something is false and they know it because uh, their sister told them or something, or quite the opposite. They say, oh yeah, this is true because my sister told me that it's true. And then when they go to the internet and verify it, they find out that it's, it's false. So uh, this type of thinking, if, if the question in the research was, uh, you know, asking about the belief that I can do it. I think people believe that they can do it, but it's different when you give them particular tasks and when you ask them about particular skills that are necessary for information verification, I would say. So I don't know how much it reflects reality, and I think we would need more research into that, into particular skills, and really giving people tasks to see what their skills are. Mm -hmm. uh, Kamel Josef, would you like to elaborate a bit more on that? Just a few notes. One of them, the self-confidence is the biggest enemy of the critical thinking in the end. But I'm not sure about the numbers because I try to, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that in our research there was a question about, uh, again, the, there was a claim. And there was a claim about, uh, I'm not, sometimes I'm not able to recognize what is uh, true or fake news, simplify. And there was a just a f half, uh, just a half people, just a 50 percent vote there. And I think that uh, it's depend on the methodology of the research in the end. And usually, if somebody is asking for if it's sure, that usually answer yes. But if uh, you ask him for, uh, for example, for the scale, you receive different uh, different information. Uh, but I'm not sure in this moment. Uh, I think the problem is that uh, nobody can can uh, fact checking everything. So if you look on uh, so how many information are it's inside social networks, inside internet, so it's impossible for person or for people to to understand what's it, what is true or false. We can try to, to fact check something and someone, and so it's very it's very hard to recognize what is true and what is false. And if you ask, for example, uh, senior people or elderly people, uh, they think that uh, they can, in, in uh, maybe 80%, they can recognize because there's something uh, that told them that uh, this is true or this is false. But it's, it's not a true. It's just about feelings. So do, don't believe in feelings. In this era. If you are in love, <laughs> no. If you feel in love, believe it. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the journalist proverb that if your mother tell you that I love you, you need and find somebody who will be able to confirm it. Yeah. Um, okay. um, the, just a small note. The usually the, the trust is cheaper version of control. It's cheap to beliefs. And we still have the problem in the media literacy and uh, research and in the media also that uh, there is a two different types of uh, trust. The, the one of is a uh, Reflective trust, and the second was was it's Jakub Matzek definition. Uh, yeah. The one of the type of the trust is uh, you trust to the pilot in the airplane that he is able to 
fly with the airplane. <laughs> this is one type of trust. The second one is the trust that this guy is saying something what is in line with my mind. And now we have in the media two different types of trust. And this is the big problem, not only, not only for society, but for the research of this, because, okay, the 70% people believes to public broadcasting service. Which way? <laughs> that they are providing the, the journalist job with the good standards, or that they express their point of view? Uh, thank you. Let's now focus on uh, schools and education. Um, also, I think that some of us know that, uh, because we are in Brussels, in Brussels bubble, that the European Commission recently published actually a guidelines for teachers. Uh, yeah, Kamil was so nice and he even printed uh, these uh, guidelines <laughs> for, for us. Uh, and I asked our panelists uh, in advance to if they can read these uh, guidelines and comment on that, like whether they think that um, such an initiative of the European Commission was um, you know, a good move, that, for example, the European Commission should uh, do more when it comes to education of teachers or providing them with guidelines. Um, so, um, Kamil, I know that you printed the, <laughs> the guidelines. I read it, I read you it. You know <laughs> what, what it's inside. Uh, when I went through, I saw some, you know, some tips for the teachers, uh, what they should do to, to learn students to detect disinformation, for example. Mm, are these guidelines enough for teachers? No. <laughs> So right, what's, what's missing there? What's, what's, yes. what's missing first in the guidelines? For the f uh, first of all, uh, guidelines are, are nice, yeah, great, but uh, there are no examples of activities which are uh, usable at, at primary or secondary schools because uh, what uh, teachers uh, need is uh, are e examples. So examples of activities, examples of uh, for, for fact-checking, for, for uh, using uh, at primary and secondary school level. So it's really uh, theoretically material. Uh, it's ab about how to improve maybe a uh, process of, of fact-checking or process of debunking, but it's not, uh, it's not good, good for teachers. Uh, so my, my improvement could be uh, to add some examples of real activities which uh, could be useful, useful in the Czech uh, region, in the Czech uh, area. And I think that the problem is also language. Because the language of, of these this, uh, gui uh, guidelines, uh, I think the most of people doesn't speak English at Czech uh, primary schools or secondary schools. It's first, and uh, and the second, they don't know uh, that uh, this material exists because there are no channels between Ministry of Education and uh, schools or primary secondary level uh, to to, for example upload this material to primary or the, or the secondary schools. So there is a block, there is a barrier uh, between Ministry of Education and schools. And if we improve this process, if we translate it, and if we, if we add some examples of ac activities, it could be better for schools. Uh, Lucia, can you imagine that you uh, attend a school or you are going to school to, to give a lecture and you take guidelines and distribute it to, to teachers? Do you think that something like that could work? I think it could work on the teachers that invite us to their schools because they are always, uh, usually they are active and they are interested in the topic. So I think it could help them uh, with development of some of their own materials. But I think and I can agree that what works the best is to give teachers exact tasks for kids and give them methodology, give them the support and be as specific as possible in what tasks are we giving them. So this is good context for teachers but i think that, that there should be you know something more yeah something like really particular and very uh, very specific tasks for students and there are some tips but i think that the specific activities are much better because it's also easier for teachers because they are often we realize they are really overwhelmed by their work and by everything that they have to do so it's much better for them to introduce them to, to this topic by giving them some example, some activity that they can start with. Uh, thank you. Do you see any other tools how to actually motivate teachers, you know, to because Kamel presented some, some yeah. data that uh, the media literacy, some teachers already included it somehow into their lecture, but there's a huge gap. So how to motivate teachers actually to 
you know, to, to focus more on this information and to, to teach their students how to detect Okay, first problem is that media, media education is uh, not a subject. It's not mandatory part of education. So if, we, if it's not a subject, so what motivates the teachers to, to, for example, visit some long life education lessons? Or so, so I think it's a, it's a first problem. The second problem is that uh, the educational system is really huge. There are re a lot of topics, there are uh, a lot of, lot of subjects, and the teachers, uh, they don't, it, it's not necessary for teachers to, for example, select uh, media education lessons. They can select envir environmental education, they can select uh, inclusion or other, other topics. So there is n not uh, some, some kind of process, of systematic process, how to improve their skills in, in media of, uh, uh, in, in, in this, in this, uh, oh, in the media literacy, uh, because it's not uh, the subject which is at primary or secondary school. And can you imagine that uh, in a school for like the teachers that are preparing themselves to teach actually faculties, faculties <laughs> uh, that they could, uh, for example, learn uh, teachers systematically how to do it during their actually work? It's a similar because uh, there is there ne not consistent content between uh, between f uh, faculties in area of me media education. Uh, if I say something about Faculty of edu Education, Palacki University, it's promotion. So we have... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have media literacy as as many many various subjects uh, at uh, Bachelor and and uh, other other studies. We have also PhD programs, so we implement it inside our programs. And there are subjects about online safety, about media literacy, about disinformation, but uh, it's not a standard uh, because if I look on another faculties, they can't do this. They can make uh, another kind of subjects. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Before we were discussing some European guidelines, and I have maybe a question for Josef, because I know that you were involved in some international projects tackling disinformation, so I was wondering whether it is possible to have some kind of European approach when it comes to fight uh, against disinformation, because I know that you know situation in every country is a bit specific. So how actually we can uh, cooperate at the European level when it comes to not only tackling this disinformation but also uh, you know uh, making <laughs> it so in some structured <laughs> way? I know it's <laughs> difficult, sorry, but you will make it. Thank you. That's maybe the question for the Camille. But okay, uh, honestly, I think that the media literacy education is just a small part of this game. Uh, I think that the first step is start to accept the problems with the disinformation, conspiracy theories, populist framing seriously. This is the first point. And I'm still not sure that the every country in the in the Europe, uh, regardless of war in in Ukraine, accept this as a serious problem. This is the first step. The second one. I believe in the cooperation uh, networking in the low level. And I think that the supporting of networking between the all types of educators is the best way for the sharing uh, the practices and, and activities, etc. This is I still think that the Erasmus Plus is doing a good job in this way. The third one, I think that uh, we still not able to accept that we are uh, in the war. <laughs> and uh, sometime in the war we need to do some measurements which are not uh, in the line in, the, in uh, our day lives. And I think that we are in this moment. And if governments will be open discuss what our values, uh, if we will be able to say that we are in the war, the disinformation conspiracies are a real problem. If we start to work on the four lines of defense, then we will motivate the, the teachers also to be part of this game. And the last but not least, we are in the war, and this is the reason why we see some fog. But disinformation and conspiracy was there before the war started. And it's not connected just with the Russians and the Chinese guys. And they are also connected with the rise of populism in the whole world and with the people who lost their trust in the future in this world. And we need to add some social strategy 
for the, how to improve the lives of these people. And then we will be able to fight again this uh, disinformation successfully. Yosef, yeah. maybe follow-up question for you, because you mentioned that there are some countries that do not fully recognize the threats that are coming with disinformation. Uh, can you name I think Ger countries? Germany made some progress in the, <laughs> in the <laughs> previous months, and Brussels made some progress. I'm still waiting when the EU disinfo database will be open to map again the official media from country like Netherlands. Four years ago, Netherlands strongly pushed this info unit to remove some outlets because there was a mainstream, but th sometimes mainstream sharing this information. And I think that without this, we will be not able to do this. And the one thing, and maybe I'll thank you for, for, the <laughs> for this question, the last point, what we need, it's not only the media literacy, we need also establish something like media critical platforms to get the journalists the strong feedback. Because the Hanayim asked me before we start about the fake news. Yeah, and you missed in my presentation this term. Because the fake news as usually is the misinformation and really bad journalistic job. And we have no platform for discussing the really bad journalistic war <laughs> work in the countries, and we need it. Thank you, uh, Kamel. Maybe, would like may to maybe yeah. I'd like to add uh, some points. Uh, first is about responsibility of uh, sharing. I think that uh, uh, we can't uh, make 100% uh, to improve education in real media, uh, media education, but we can improve sharing. So if we will be responsible for sharing what, what we share, so it could be better the situation, because I think the problem is that many people share something. I think that, that they don't know that they are sharing this information. Or mis uh, they share misinformation. So they share something what they believe in, but uh, they don't know that it's disinformation. So I think it's a problem. Responsibility for, for sharing. That's all. Yeah. yeah, if I may just add uh, maybe more on the media audience level, which is part of my research, and also you also mentioned it. And I can only fully agree that it's it's a complex problem in a way that we realized in our research that uh, solving or helping people to tell the difference uh, between false information and stuff like that only helps with um, a specific way that people trust media and it's the normative way, which means that people trust media because they do their job in a good way. They adhere to professional standards. They are good journalists. But then there is the, the other trust, and we call it cohesive trust. And that means that media inform uh, for in a way that uh, it helps people like me. D these media are for me, he, he are here for me. And that's actually a problem, for example, with Czech television and public service media, because the normative trust uh, in uh, such institutions is always high. And I can imagine it's high also for teachers. But when we ask people if they feel that uh, public service media is here for them and it's their favorite news outlet, it's much lower. And this is the difference. And this is the part of trust in media that we cannot heal with by uh, teaching people uh, to see disinformation and tell the difference between false and tr uh, and accurate news. So the problem is more complex and it we also need to hear journalism as such, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Josef, would you, yeah. Just a small positive note. Uh, I think that the EU does info info did a great job in the previous years and they have the database with uh, 11,000 disinformation and here is the guidelines and I think that that could be great source for the um, real examples from all countries uh, in Europe. Uh, thank you. I have one more question before I will pass the floor to to audience. Um, I think that, or that's my assumption, that um, when we are speaking about teachers and students, I think that we s at some point have to face this like generational barrier because, for example. Me, I'm nearly 30 <laughs> years old, but I'm consuming news information from media, from news, classical news sites like uh, Czech television and so on. But uh, younger generation, students, uh, teenagers, they consume news from uh, not even Facebook, not even Twitter by TikTok. 
and other new uh, new media or new social sites and so on. So uh, I was wondering wh whether it is possible to keep teachers update <laughs> to these technologies, uh, Kamil. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The By attending your answer. courses, <laughs> it was right? answered. <laughs> it was answered. Uh, for example, at our faculty, we have a special subject wi which are focusing on using of social networks in the process of education, uh, and we are speaking about TikTok, about uh, I don't know Snapchat, about uh, musically between a TikTok, but also about Facebook, uh, Instagram, and other social networks. And I think that the young generation of teachers, uh, which will go to the to the praxis at primary or secondary school, uh, they will know about. Uh, using of, of these uh, the social networks in a process of education, but uh, I don't know uh, I, I don't know how to improve uh, this. Uh, if we speak about teachers which are 50 years old, if you look on an average, we, we see that there are many many other teachers. But I think that uh, faculties are trying to improve this situation. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lucia. I will maybe add my experience for, from media education for older people because the, the older people that go to media literacy programs at least uh, in, in Prague in, in, in one organization where I sometimes assist, uh, they are very, very diverse in, in terms of the sources that they have, in terms of sources of information. Some of them use Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and some of them just read news and newspaper. And what we learned there is that the, the universal way of thinking, of critically thinking about information and asking ourselves the, the basic questions about the news and the piece of information that we receive is universal whether you receive it from TikTok, whether you receive it from Instagram, Facebook, newspaper or from your friend. So I think this might be the way to kind of go after the, the universal questions that we need to ask ourselves when we uh, encounter something that is strange or too emotional, and this might help also for, for various generations. Mm -hmm. Come out, please. I, I think that uh, the most relevant source of information for, for example, children are, are influencers, especially influencers on TikTok, on uh, YouTube, and on other platforms. So they don't need uh, some, some newspapers uh, in, in the age uh, till, till 15 years. After that, I think that they will use, for example, Wikipedia and other tools. But if uh, they are younger, for example, from 9 to 12, I think that th they don't need another services. Maybe you will say something. Yeah. Is it? No. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, so I think it's time to give uh, the floor to our audience, so uh, if there is anybody who has a question, uh, I will be more than happy to, to, pass to pass you the floor, so please just raise your hand, yes, and introduce us yourself, please. Hello, uh, thank you for the discussion, it was very interesting, my name is Filip Křenek, and uh, I have a question actually, uh, as you were involved to some extent in this maybe comparative research across uh, European countries. Uh, I don't know to what extent you may have been, but maybe you know at least uh, some results. For instance, if there are differences, let's say, in trust uh, towards disinformation in countries with different educational systems. So you would have, for instance, on one hand, educational systems which uh, you know, earlier on tend to educate people towards critical thinking, so tend to educate them in searching for information themselves, whereas the Czech system, as we most of us know, is heavily on the, you know, uh, memorization type of uh, learning. So if you would have, I mean, I don't know if that's uh, going too broad, but maybe there are some researches in that uh, direction. This is a really good question. <laughs> But I have no answer for this, but I think that I think that there is could be a way to how to do it. We have the uh, this is the PISA test also, what is that? Yeah. Uh, you can compare the PISA test and the information from the Eurobarometer and try to find there is some some correlation. Uh, yes, it could be very interesting as a basic research, but I don't think so that some kind of this research was did before. I'm not I'm not involved in this kind of research. So
Thank you very much for uh, this question. I think that you could maybe provoke uh, some <laughs> research ideas in our uh, speakers. Uh, are there any? Yeah, I can see. Um, OK, so first, uh, Ms. Shudrova, and then, then uh, Lady back there. So yeah. please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy that you can present here this, I think, good example. Uh, what you do in Olomouc in faculty and uh, Charles University. E uh, security, it's a very good uh, program. Maybe uh, I didn't catch if you, uh, because uh, the targets group are not only teachers, uh, students, but also parents, if I remember. Yeah, so just uh, this, and you uh, you told about uh, countries, Ms. Zakhwa, you asked if, if some countries, uh, European countries could be example when they uh, have good preparation or they have good policy on this. Um, and you mentioned Brussels, that Brussels is aware on this risk. You, you uh, uh, Mr. Schlerka, you said that it's necessary to recognize that it's a really serious risk. But in the, in the European Parliament, we uh, have a, um, from the March this year resolution about um, how uh, this information campaign interfered to the police and how they uh, endanger the, uh, the democracy in the Europe. Um, my question, if I, if I made uh, some question, is about uh, services of the, uh, about media of the public services. I see it like crucial because I think it's not so uh, recognized in uh, the European policy. I can say that I, I work for eight years in the European Parliament in the Committee of, Cult of Culture and Education. Now, for example, we have a new uh, act, uh, European uh, Freedom Media, uh, Media Freedom Act. Um, and I, I am happy that you show that uh, the teachers use uh, public uh, public media ser uh, service. Yes. Uh, why? Because um, yes, we fight for independent, free media. But there is not role of private media. They can be independent and can be balanced. But uh, media of public services. By the law, they should be uh, independent, trustful, and balanced. There is their task. Therefore, we pay, well, citizens pay for their contributions. So I think it, would be, it, it is for the people, like I can say, the, they can do this uh, comparison if they really want to know, the, to have a trustful news they should they should have some medium they can uh, refer so maybe it would be uh, my intent is to really I, I, I apologize to ensure to to make safe and to very s mm, strong position for the media of public services because without that I was uh, two two weeks I was in uh, Hungary it is big problem it is a big risk because they, they, they don't exist, media of the public services which are independent, pay by uh, contributions. They are uh, fully dependent of a state budget, of the government budget, and so on. And we had a meeting with media, and they, they, did, they don't recognize that their intense their interest is to have strong media public services so just it's uh, yeah you spoke about uh, media literacy of course but critical thinking is in the in the beginning of everything and then you can build this uh, mm, media uh, media literacy across it, it is it is i i don't fight for a special subject on the primary schools there is a cross sexual subject that should be in, in the languages, for example, Czech or uh, mother tongue, then uh, foreign language, they can build an across all subject media literacy. In the primary school, then in a secondary school, you can build, uh, you, can, you can have some courses on media services, 
but you should <laughs> do it across all sections so, or, or, or uh, across all subjects. But um, I, I would like to thank you for your uh, work, what do you do, and we should extend it and we sh should share uh, our um, practices. But the Finland is very good uh, country which uh, cope with this problem. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, so I would like to ask the speakers to reflect on the public media, uh, then uh, countries, which can be like named as the front runners when it comes to fighting disinformation, and then uh, the other target groups of education when it comes to disinformation, tackling dif disinformation like parents, older people, and, and so on. So I'll pass you the microphone and you can react. Just three short uh, notes, the one of them. I think that uh, if I said that uh, countries need to start seriously take this problem, I think that um, uh, Vera Europa is doing a great job in this way, but it's completely disconnected with the other, <laughs> other guys. With the support of the finance departments, we were not, ab not able to do nothing. You can see this in the Czech Republic. Michal Klima is going to do a really good job, but without the financing, <laughs> nobody able to do. The second point, I don't think so that the public broadcasting is the right answer for our problems because the problems with the people who believe in the conspiracy theories is that they have probably a little bit uh, different types of cognitive capabilities. Capabilities, capabilities thank you. <laughs> and they prefer a different type of messages sometimes. And I think that the big rows of tabloids, for example, uh, we need to push our tabloids to work much harder on this. I think, for example, the build is doing a great job in the Germany in this way. And sometimes the build works on Ukraine better than our public broadcasting. And the last point, uh, long life education. <laughs> That's the point. Because, okay, if we start in the school with the media literacy, it's fine. But after 20 years, so I will try to say something to educational level. So I see I, I, uh, I see the big problem in the framework curriculum. Uh, now we are changing our framework educational curriculum, and I don't know if you know, but uh, media education was deleted uh, from this curriculum. So in, in a new revision of this kind of curriculum, there is no media literacy or media media education as as a subject which uh, which is uh, cross subjectal form. So it was removed from from the framework. So I'm trying to, I wrote to Ministry of Education and I, I try to open this question, but uh, if you look on, on uh, the draft of uh, framework, uh, there is no, no no there's nothing like uh, media education or media literacy in the Czech Republic. So I think th this is really big, big problem for future. But uh, the, the, the framework is changing now, so maybe at the result of, of the change we will see something different. But right now we don't see a subject or intersubjectal uh, topic uh, uh, media literacy. Yeah, it was removed. Thank you. I, I have just a small note about public service media because my colleague on PhD is doing really interesting research on Czech television and expectations from Czech television. And what she found out is that um, people who uh, have populist beliefs and they, for example, vote for populist parties, they have different expectations from public service media. They want them to be objective, but at the same time they want them to speak uh, with the voice that they fear is their own, and it's sort of in in you know in a cr clash, I would say, and that's the problem that I honestly don't know how to tackle. And I think that if if I if I knew the medicine, it would be great, but the problem is that uh, people with uh, conspiracy beliefs or with populist uh, attitudes have different expectations from public service media, and the way that public service media operate is. Uh, by, by default somehow problematic to them because it's the diversity that doesn't make sense at, at this point. Just I, I hope I didn't uh, mess up my friend's <laughs> research, but I think this is gener generally the idea that public service media is not really trustworthy because it doesn't reflect what they expect. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that there was another uh, question uh, from the lady on the left side, oh, okay. the brown hairs. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
glasses. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's more of a comment rather than a question. My name is Simona Petkova. I work in the Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture of the European Commission. And I'm actually part of the team who has been working on the guidelines. So uh, <laughs> I wanted to really... Yes, thank you so much for the feedback. Uh, no, I want... <laughs> no, um, okay. No, joke aside, thanks a lot for this really insightful and really great discussion. It was wonderful to hear all these uh, viewpoints. Moreover, the feedback that you shared uh, before I stood up. Uh, we are still in the beginning of the journey of these guidelines, so obviously any feedback is, is very welcome for, for the next steps. Maybe just um, to sh say that the guidelines will be translated in all EU official languages, including Czech, by the end of the month, so hopefully this will help for them to reach easier the classrooms across the EU. And uh, since you mentioned Erasmus Plus and teacher training, I really cannot not mention that next year actually promoting teacher training on tackling this information and digital literacy will be reinforced through Erasmus Plus next year. So thank you so much again for this discussion. Thank you very much for, for this comment and for uh, sharing us with uh, details on further work of the European Commission when it comes to tackling this information. Um, is there any reaction? No, we are just, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. We, <laughs> uh, we have uh, time for another, yes, I can see me, yes. Hi, I'm Sandra Miholova, I'm from the Czech Embassy. And um, there's maybe three tiny points that strike me. Um, there's this old Czech saying that says, levně koupeno, draho placeno. Uh, for English, uh, English speak, uh, speakers only, um, if you buy something cheaply, it ends up being very expensive. And I feel that at this point, this is something that we very much should, Im should be investing into. Uh, one of the points I feel, when I look at Camille's presentation, um, there's so many teachers that feel that it's a very important subject. Why is it not mandatory? And why do the same people say that they don't teach it? Um, to me, the point is, do we have teachers to teach the teachers? I've myself been at a point where, when I was leaving for Brussels, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came to the conclusion that some of our employees don't know their own computers well enough. And we were subjected to a course of computer literacy. Trust me, the teacher was so unfriendly, he was about 25, and he looked at us as like, oh look at you old bats, I have to tell you what an Excel spreadsheet looks like and how to work with it. It doesn't make you feel good, <laughs> it makes your self-confidence level drop somewhere and it blocks it out, that's one point. Uh, for the teachers that at almost 100% feel that this is important, um, of course having it as a mandatory subject should facilitate getting, getting these teachers to a good teacher who can teach them, so in order so to, to make them be able to teach the kids. And the third point would be to what you're saying about media. There's a rather largest, largest trend right now, uh, worldwide, uh, a linguistic one, trying to teach media to use easy language. Uh, I know that it may sound stupid to address um, intellectually disabled people, but also some of our foremost politicians have said right out that half of our nation is intellectually in inferior. All of them vote. All of them believe in what they read, in whatever they're capable of reading. So we should be able to bring them closer to the media that that really presents the truth. Even for the senior group of citizens who are totally scared of computers, often just working on an old computer that they've inherited from their children, uh, it would be very nice to get the message through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these few points, but very interesting points. Uh, who would like to react first, Camille? I'd like to react on teaching of teachers. I think uh, from the point of view of a faculty of education, it's really not a problem to prepare teacher for media literacy, for media education. So uh, I think that th there's not, it's not about knowledge, but uh, it's about reality. That uh, if I want to make a teacher, I need a teacher for some subject which exists in a system. So I, I can't prepare some education for teachers for subject, subject which is not, yeah. So it's, it's a problem from my po point of view. Thank you. 
no more reactions there on a mandatory um, lectures, teaching teachers, no? <laughs> it's still about the politic will. And I think this is a crucial problem. There is no will. Uh, from the different angle, from my point, from my side, in Czech Republic, no nobody wants to tell this is conspiracy, this is fake news sites, this is disinformation from the government side. Nobody, until Michal comes to their work in the in the office. But <laughs> if there is nobody who will be able this official, there is no will. Sorry for this. So maybe maybe so, something about I don't know if you know the concept uh, multiliteracy. Multiliteracy is a concept from Finlandia, and it's a con con uh, it's a concept where in every subject of primary and secondary school is media uh, media literacy implemented as a part of this subject. So there are uh, results in every every uh, subject in this area. Maybe we could make something in in our curriculum too. Uh, we have also in the Czech Republic we have uh, one one results. I think it's in fifth grade that, for example, child can recognize manipulation in uh, advertisement. So it's one of of the result, but nothing else. So the way could be that we will add to other subjects this topic. But uh, as told, uh, Josef, uh, it's it depends on politics. Thank you very much. It was also something that was uh, mentioned by Ms. Ms. Schoedrova before. Um, I have many a question related to investments because there were also mentioned uh, money and financing. Uh, maybe question for uh, Lucia. Um, how it is difficult to actually find uh, money to find funding for projects like Fakescape today. Uh, if there are any, you know, if the government, for example, supports you or if you can use <laughs> EU funding for that. So if you could react on the, you know, financing funding possibilities for projects like, like Fakescape that are helping uh, teachers. And if I'm not mistaken, Fakescape is uh, also offering the courses for free. So there should be any, you know, financial backing from anybody else, I would guess. Yeah, there is financial backing. We we receive uh, we receive funding. We apply for grants. We uh, use funding opportunities and projects, various fr projects, uh, and we apply for them. And I think, uh, if you need a detailed answer, my friend Teresa, who is also uh, a head of Fakescape, is here today, and she's sitting. Yeah, she's sitting back there. So you may ask her because she's uh, doing our fundraising. But this is, I would say that uh, this is our source, uh, thanks to which we can uh, offer schools workshops for free. But um, when we run out of this option and how we actually started was that schools paid for the, the workshops and they still sometimes pay for it uh, when we don't have this, this offer. But uh, many schools already have some funding and some projects and some support for such activities. So uh, it doesn't mean that children or their parents pay for our workshops. In, in many cases, it's, it's the case that they have some project and to uh, somehow spend the funding from this project, they invite us to give the workshop. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Okay, I can see two, two more. Uh, so I'd like to ask my colleague to pass the microphone. Please, the floor uh, is yours. Good evening. Petr Kobeck from European School Excel uh, and former Ministry of Education, so National Pedagogical Institute in Prague. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think, what's your opinion uh, concerning uh, the action of the government at the beginning of, uh, of Russian invasion? that they banned uh, some uh, web uh, sharing the, uh, the hoaxes. Thank you. I think it's perfect question for Josef Schlerka. And now I find limitation of my English in this moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe Hannah help me. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not able to express this in proper English. Uh, z mého pohledu rozumím všem těm krokům, které se staly, ale myslím si, ale já to zkusím anglicky. I, I, I understand all steps which was done by uh, Czech government, but uh, in the end I'm not happy with this. Because 
there was it was something like in the times of the COVID. Uh, we received we received some time, but we w we was able to do nothing through this time. And I honestly I believe that in the future there will be law or better work of judgments and judges uh, than this kind of improvisation, like the we friendly, please our friends from the uh, internet provider to block something. This is not good because it's not aligned with the law. And I understand why it's happened, but for the future, it's not the way. That's my answer. Yeah, just for our uh, English speaking uh, audience here, um, there was al also this uh, European, let's say, ban of uh, Russia today and Sputnik, but meanwhile, there was a Czech, let's say, measure. Uh, some kind of agreement between the government and internet providers to ban some uh, other websites. Uh, so they were uh, not working. Yes. By the way, this is a good example, uh, the banning of the Sputnik and Russia Today sites. I think that is what, it, it's okay. The, ban the banning of the Russia Today and Sputnik news is okay. But if you look on the Germany, especially in this moment, you can see that every day the Russia Today starts with a new website, with a new domain, and the German government is not able to hunting this. Yeah. 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 That's just an example. Thank you. Yes, uh, can we pass the microphone to Ms. Shoydrova, please? Yeah. Thank you. So it's a very interesting question, this one, because I'm coming from the, from our committee where we discussed about uh, implementation new directive uh, audiovisual media directive ser uh, services directive when um, uh, one experts uh, recommended that what was uh, like exception uh, for this year for uh, this year about uh, sanctions uh, on this uh, disinformation web webs which was done on the European uh, uh, level and some countries uh, went uh, far from the far yes um, I think that is the principle what is uh, illegal uh, offline should be illegal online do you can imagine to spread those information by the, by the newspapers uh, like uh, uh, newspapers uh, <laughs> Printed? No, it's not, it would be not possible. But online is everything possible. It's not possible. It, it's excuse me. I should. I, I really agree that what is banned, what is not possible, uh, offline should be banned or online because uh, if not, we will. Lost. Uh, I understand you, <laughs> but <laughs> I completely agree that what is illegal offline must be illegal in online. But you can imagine that you friendly ask uh, the printer to stop printing newspaper without the law, without the... Yeah, uh, the, the so no, no, it's not about, it's not about, you are not able to s just without the result of the judge court stop printing newspaper. You <laughs> you need to enforce it, and from já to já řeknu česky. V mém světě je problém s tím, že tam nebyly soudní rozhodnutí. Tam se přátelsky požádalo někoho, aby něco udělal. A je to na úrovni v offline světě, kdybyste přátelsky požádali tiskárnu, aby přestala tisknout noviny. Musíte mít soudní rozhodnutí předběžní třeba. A tady prostě nebylo. Byla to výjimečná situace. Začala válka. Chápu to. Ale není to systematická cesta. And I will switch again to the English, sorry. Yeah, I think it's about uh, having a different language because English is what people are speaking. There is a thin line between the freedom of speech and about the uh, disinformation. Disinformation, you have the right to spread disinformation in the end. What is not your in your right is if you if something's happened based on your disinformation, you are not able to spread hate speech, for example. You are not able to spread public threats to somebody. You are not able to spread anti-Semitism. We have 
all these principles in our laws, but we don't apply this principle. For example, the Aeronet was spreading anti-Semitism for the four or five years. Nobody from government or police care about it. Nobody stop it. And after war starting, we, yes, we are able to do it. We just ask the providers to stop it. This is, this is what I try to say. We need law, not, I think that not law, we need much better police work, we need much better judge work, work. And without this, it will be just the, 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 the law for the, the, you have the right to promote this information if you want. It's possible, yeah, but you, <laughs> the uh, Russia Today and Sputnik News, they have no human rights. It's, it's necessary to be said. The human rights belongs just for the citizen, not for the bots, not for the anonymous accounts, not for the foreign media. Russia today has no freedom of speech because it's a Russia propaganda machine as a part of the war. And this is different than if you just stop the server running by the citizen. This is different situation. Uh, this is different situation. Uh, thank you. I think we have maybe time for one more uh, question. I think there was somebody. Yes, I can see there. It will be the last uh, last question, please. Hi. Sorry, won't keep you long. Um, my name is Lenka Volkova, and I work at the um, representation of the self-governing region of Kosice across the street. So say hi whenever you're walking by. Um, um, I just wanted to reflect on the theory that Mr. Schlerka introduced at the beginning of his presentation, um, not to cause any disrespect to the person that came up with it, but I do think that it causes a bit of information elitism um, unintentionally, purely because I think a, an additional step might be necessary, which would prove to help bridge the gap between um, what we want, to you know, the type of information that we want to be shared, which is the truth, and the people that um, in your graphs showed that you know were unsure about what the truth was and that were on the opposite side of the spectrum, because um, obviously you have different information bubbles that exist. And I wanted to ask whether you thought that, because theoretically we can talk about anything, um, but I wanted to ask if you thought that practically, whether a mechanism can be put in place which will help bridge the gap between what the truth is and what we want people to uh, actually see it. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, please. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the term the information elitism. Yeah. But yeah, uh, if you look on the Czech Republic, we know from the other researches that there is uh, 20 people who are interested in the serious newspapers and broadcasting, just the 20 period, just 20%. Mm -hmm. The regularly consume the news from the mainstream media. We know that there is a 40% people who don't intentionally uh, consume the news in the media, 40%. And also we know that there is a 40% who, uh, who prefer some kinds of infotainment, some kind of tabloids, and this way. I think that there is two different strategies for, for these different groups. I think that we need to talk with the tabloids <laughs> Uh, definitely. We need to speak with Nova, with uh, Blask. Yeah, it's our work. We need to find a way how to simplify our language and speak with this media outlets. For the rest, there is a, a little bit problem because the part of them uh, are the young people who are don't care about the politics. Unfortunately, we have no deep researches about this group because if you compare it, for example, with England, you can find that the reason for these young people why they don't consume media sometimes is that they are not able to find their preferred topics in the media. Like, for example, climate change, for example, the LGBT community rights and many others. Uh, by the way, if you try to find something about the esports in the Czech newspaper, uh, then, in this way, there is a hope that Czech media start again write about the topics which are interested for the young people. And there is a 20 people, 20% 20 people, who probably we will be not able to catch. But some of them are the part of the anti-systems uh, movement in Czech Republic. 
you know, in Czech Republic, uh, from the Velvet Revolution, we have still between the 15 and 20 percent support of the extremistic parties, like the Communist parties and other parties. And this is our new normal. 30 years, is, this, this, this is true. And maybe we are, it's not necessary to catch this part of the society. We need to know about this, par this part of the society. We need to try to support, but probably we have no way how to speak with this part. That's my answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to move to the last part of our discussion, which will be practical. Because as I said in the beginning, uh, Lucie prepared uh, for you uh, an exercise. So I would like to now pass, pass the floor again to Lucie so she will explain you what we are going to do right now. Prepare your phones. <laughs> yes, you'll do a short version of our English workshop for all the students. And um, you'll need just your phones because there will be QR codes. I decided to distribute the worksheets uh, this way so you can find it on your phones. And uh, just to give you a brief timeline of this, I'll just give you uh, the, the introduction and you'll try two tasks from the game and you'll be able to end them by yourself uh, only with the instructions in the worksheets that you, you'll see later. Um, if you need any help or if you have any comments, you can, you can tell me uh, in the meantime. But uh, after you finish, I think there will be just a short, sh short yeah, ending by, by the two of us, but uh, you can finish the game by yourselves. And then uh, when we do these workshops at schools, we usually then have a discussion and a short lecture, which we will not do today. Uh, but um, if you have anything and you would like to discuss the game with me, uh, we can grab a glass of wine together after this part. So um, we can move on to the, just wait a second. In this game and in this workshop, all of our, I think we're having. Okay, sorry, I, ho I hope we solved it. Um, in this workshop, uh, you all turn into journalists that live in a country called Fake Land. And uh, it's the year 2028. And in 2028, in Fake Land, uh, there is a presidential election coming up. And you as a journalist obviously work hard because it's the presidential election. And all of a sudden, all of you receive email about important press conference that invites you uh, to share some big news about presidential candidates with you. So you all as journalists go to the press conference when all of a sudden the lights go out, the electricity goes out, and in the chaos when you try to somehow get out of the building, you find a phone with an active call, and when you pick it up, you hear this sound. Good evening, my friends. I have exclusive news for you. I found out that tonight, one of the candidates is planning to sign an agreement in which he pledges to cancel holidays. And he's not going to do it in a democratic manner, if you know what I mean. I am sure that I'm being followed, so I can't tell you neither who I am, nor the name of the villain. However, I have clues that will lead you to him. I've sent them to all the editorial offices via email. By solving four tasks, you will obtain a code with which you can unlock this phone and acquire the information on who's the villain. So you will have only two tasks, uh, and these are the links to the tasks. You have QR codes, you have the shortened links, and if you need any help, uh, just put your hand up, I can help you with the task. And I think you should be able to, to finish it by yourself, but in any case, I'm here for you. So good luck with the game. <laughs> Impressive. Thank you very much, uh, Lucie. We will now give some time to, to the audience. I hope that all of you found the, the PDF document. Lucie, can you tell us how old kids are normally solving this? Uh, because it's not easy. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, we usually give give these to to children and students uh, of 15 to 19 years old, and we give them 45 minutes. And this is the first two tasks, and then we have two more. And I would say these two are the, the like the first one is the longest. So yeah, I know it's not easy. I think it, it could take you about 10 to 20 minutes, just an approximation, and and you'll see. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, explanation. I know that our audience is uh, well educated, so they will be okay with five minutes or something <laughs> like that. Okay, one thing that might not be uh, clear, uh, there is the, the final website where you're supposed to enter the code is in the task two, in the information uh, at the top of the page. It's fakescape.eu slash code. It should be the website for finishing the game. Uh, okay, so I don't know if there is anybody who already solved the task. Doors are still closed. Yeah, I hope that all of you at least tried and learned uh, the task, learned the story of the presidential candidates, of the fake land and so on. Uh, you can of course uh, enjoy the game later or at home, you can try it, try it again. Um, I think now it's time to officially uh, end our discussion uh, and to move to more informal networking part where we can discuss with our speakers uh, on the issues you would like to or ask Lucia uh, more about the fakescape uh, game and so on. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion. Uh, I think we can give another applause to our great speakers. And uh, before, I would like to pass the floor to the organizers of uh, this uh, great event. And I would like to pass the floor to Vendra Novačko, head of the representation of the South Moravian region to the EU, please. Thank you, Aneta. And thank you all that uh, you uh, stay with us and you enjoy this uh, great debate. Thank you so much, uh, uh, our guests. And uh, now I would like to uh, invite you to uh, the South Moravian wine and uh, you can uh, finish uh, the fake escape game uh, during uh, drinking our wine and have uh, some uh, snacks with us. <laughs> That's the that's the reward uh, for for the uh, for for the game, and uh, uh, now uh, just uh, let me thank you all that uh, you could come, and uh, b uh, uh, by the representation of the South Moravian region and uh, the cello office. So enjoy the rest uh, of the evening. <laughs>